Welcome into the PFF podcast. Steve Palazzolo here along with Sam Munson. We welcomed him to the States last week. He lives here in Cincinnati now. So American Sam, welcome once again. We're in the office, our office in Cincinnati. Got a little construction going on here, but it's good to be in person, you know, doing the podcast, and good to be back with you. Not just in the office, but in what is soon to become our podcast studio. Yeah, so for video podcasting, perhaps, if you guys want to see our pretty faces, that could be... Uh, and why wouldn't works. you? Hey, why wouldn't you? It, we're more than just silhouettes. We're yes. more than just the silhouettes on your uh, podcast avatar right now. We are actual faces. So you guys might be seeing us... Shortly, we're going to be going through preseason week one, the things that stood out, a lot of rookie discussion. Before we dive in, though, I really want to tell you guys about my favorite new way to play fantasy football over at playdraft.com. You can also access it through the App Store. Just search Draft. That's the name of the app. It is a fantastic way to play fantasy football. It's a best ball format, meaning you're just going to draft your team and then just leave it for the rest of the season. NFL. You get 18 players. They'll grab your best quarterback, best few running backs, receivers, tight ends. And you don't have to worry about the waiver wire trades. You don't have to worry about injuries. They will take your best players. And I just love how quick and easy it is. You can have a quick, easy draft, which took me under an hour. Or you can take a little bit longer and do about eight hours per pick. And the best part about all of this is you can win real money. That's right. You put up a little bit of money. There are real prizes, real money prizes to be won. You can play a $1 game, a $3 game, $10, $100, whatever you like. And the drafts start every few minutes, literally every few minutes. Jump in any single time you want. And we have a very special offer at PFF. Once you make your first $10 deposit, you will get a free $3 game. Just have to use the promo code PFF. So it's over at playdraft.com or in the App Store under draft. Use the promo code PFF with your first $10 deposit and get a free $3 game. And fantasy is so easy. This game is so easy that even Sam, even Sam has played and wants to play. And Sam does not generally like to play the fantasy football. Yeah, this is the perfect fantasy football game venue for me because I am way too lazy to play fantasy football the regular way. And busy, I, I, right? We're pretty busy during the season. That too, that too. But there's no way I can deal with waiver wires every week. I, you know, keeping an eye on everything that's going on, my team, cutting guys, moving guys in. This is perfect. It, you get to pick once and you get to do it all through an app as well. So I don't need to go near the computer. I don't need to, you know, spend hours of my week doing all this stuff. You just get in, get out. And you're the perfect person to uh, to sell it because, yeah, you're uh, generally anti-fantasy football. So get over there, playdraft.com. Promo code is PFF. Okay, preseason week one, kind of, week 1.1, 1. 1, Hall of Fame week. Does that count? They really need to sort that out. Like, just call the Hall of Fame game something and then this is preseason week one. It's trouble for us internally because we, we have to work in this, you know, uh, programming type of system where it's like this is week one, two, three. So we always call week one, week two, and it's, it's very confusing internally. So Not good. Uh, so the first full week, full week of preseason, Sam, I think the biggest story, you have to start with quarterbacks. You, I mean, we start with quarterbacks with a lot of different things. But when you talk about the rookie quarterbacks, how much discussion there was leading up to the draft, post-draft, this class, how good will this class be? But we saw, at the very least, just solid performances across the board, some impressive performances. And at the very least, these guys just, they looked comfortable, you know, and they looked like they were uh, potentially ready to contribute in year one. Yeah, it's great. You know, you spend months doing this draft process, evaluating these guys in college, trying to figure out what they're going to be at the next level. And then you get one kind of 20 snap snippet of week one of preseason and everything changes. So <laughs> we were all wrong in Kaiser. Forget about it. Kaiser's now the superstar of this group. Um, you know, <laughs> Trubisky's ready to start day one. Doesn't matter that he's only played, you know, six minutes of college football. Throw him out there. He's perfect. Um, but yeah, that, it's, it's exciting because it's the first look of these guys in an NFL setting. It's not real NFL football because it's still the preseason. You're going up against backups and all this kind of stuff. But it's at least closer than college. You can start projecting and start seeing these guys on an NFL field throwing to NFL weapons against NFL defenses. 
and get an idea. And yeah, I think the thing you said was that they all looked reasonable. Nobody went out there and looked terrible and, you know, just looked like he had no business being there. You should be sitting mired on the, the third guy in the depth chart all the way through the season. All of these guys looked like they could at least get out there and do something positive week one. Yeah, and I think what I've come around to with rookies, I think for the most part, what you see early in preseason is generally what you saw in college as far as skill set goes. I mean, you know, the, the good things that Kaiser did, the big arm and uh, some of the pocket movement, he showed that in college. He also showed, you know, he had a couple easy misses and he took a couple sacks that he probably shouldn't have taken. Also showed that in college. Trubisky, his ability to throw on the move, showed it in college. That short area accuracy looked really good. Deshaun Watson had some good plays, had some had some misses as well. A lot of what we saw you know, at Clemson, same thing with Patrick Mahomes, that touchdown that he threw, <laughs> outside of structure, back across the field, across his body. I love when people analyze that throw, and some people are like, great play by Mahomes, that's his playmaking. Other people are like, come on, Rook, that's not going to work in the NFL. But... I think that's the beauty of Patrick Mahomes. You know, those there will be a cross-body pass at some point early in his career that gets intercepted. Far of like. Yeah. But there'll be some cross-body passes that are touchdowns. So I think you just saw a lot of what those guys did in college, but you just happen to see it in, you know, what you, what you said, kind of a hybrid NFL setting. Because it's still mostly against backups, but there's a lot to, to, to take out of it. You want to go uh, QB by QB and discuss them yeah. a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Start with Kaiser because yeah. everybody's talking – about the excitement with Deshaun Kaiser, throws the game-winning touchdown, deep deep ball, just perfect in stride. Uh, two really nice deep balls. Actually, the first one where he maneuvered the pocket a little bit, threw the ball about 60 yards in the air. And, uh, you know, if you guys haven't heard our analysis on Deshaun Kaiser, whether you go and check out the big-time throw cast, whether you go and check out the preseason storyline, uh, storylines episode, which is in the pro podcast, the podcast you're listening to right now, our colleague Zach Robinson trained Deshaun Kaiser this offseason leading up to the draft process. So he has some great insight on Kaiser. Uh, first thing I noticed after talking to Zach so much during the year, he, he gave me some of the specifics that they were working on. It was footwork. It was throwing to his left. And so he was off balance a lot of the times at Notre Dame. That Forget the deep balls for a minute. That stuff looked really good. For Kaiser, he just looked like mechanically and throwing the ball because he does have some accuracy issues at times. Small sample size, but so far that part of him looked pretty good the other night. Yeah, it's interesting. I I wasn't the biggest fan of Deshaun Kaiser coming out as a prospect. I, I could see the potential, you know, obviously the physical stature of the guy and the arm strength, all that kind of stuff, pretty much speaks yeah. for itself, leaps out. But there was so much bad in his tape as well, along with the good that. I just, you know, it was. It's difficult to, it's difficult to project how much of that is going to get eradicated at the next level, and, and how much he's going to be the same guy. But yeah, certainly from the first preseason game we've seen, there wasn't that much bad, and the good stuff, like you say, the stuff that he did well in college was still there. So right. you got the high ceiling, and he seems to have moved up the floor a little bit. He got rid of a lot of the, the problems at least over the course of half a game uh, that plagued him through college. Yeah, so the one thing I did say coming out of the draft, I think if you took these four quarterbacks and you looked at where they landed, because all these guys, these these guys all came in with question marks. And a lot of times a guy comes in with question marks and then you see the fit and the team and the supporting cast and it's like, oh, uh, maybe that's not going to work out. I have to say all these guys ended up in pretty good spots. Yeah. And Kaiser working with Hugh Jackson, working with these upstart Browns. And the thing I always come back to as far as pressure goes I really think Kaiser is not in a pressure situation where he has to be the guy that performs. He was their fourth pick. He was a second rounder, but the fourth selection this year. So as far as needing to be the franchise, I feel like it's a lower pressure situation for Kaiser, and I think it's a good fit for him. And the Browns rebuilt that offensive line. Oh, that, man. That yes. offensive line could easily be one of the best groups in the league this year. And whether it's Kaiser or whether it's one of the guys that are sitting in front of him, um, you know, holding the fort for a while until he's ready, whoever is quarterbacking the Browns should have a really nice situation to deal with because they're not going to be under pressure a huge amount. They still have one of the best left tackles in the league protecting his blind side. Yep. Um, you know, you've got some developing receivers or, for, for weapons. 
they should be in a pretty good situation. And so it's about as good a spot as you could land for Kaiser. And yeah, so far he looked pretty good doing it. And throwing the deep ball, Kaiser, two for two, 97 yards. And the touchdown, one one of the passes landed at the, I mean, the guy got tackled at the one yard line. Anyway, pretty much should have been two touchdowns. So that big arm certainly on display. So loved what Kaiser did the other night. Uh, you always got to pump the brakes a little bit. We're not we're not putting yellow jackets on any of these guys, but it's all about what did we see? Looked good, good start. Yeah. Uh, let's go to Deshaun Watson. We saw him first uh, Wednesday night game in isolation. Played against the Carolina Panthers. It was another game where I, I just saw a lot of the same Deshaun Watson. You know, yeah. there were plays where you know the knock on him that we our knock on him coming out of college, and he was a guy I really really wanted to like. You know, always graded well in our system. But stylistically, it was, if you give him a clean pre-snap read, he can get to it. Once you start making him go from one to two to three to four progression-wise, he doesn't always have the patience to get through there, which I I wanted to figure out, was that the Clemson system or was it a style thing? I think we saw that a little bit of that the other night where, you know, you give him that bootleg, he's making the throw. You give him, he he read a corner blitz really nicely, got the ball out. You give him a clean pre-snap read, he's okay. Couple times I thought he ducked his head and, you know, started scrambling. Uh, a little bit too early, but you also saw the athleticism, 15-yard touchdown run. What do you what do you think of Watson's performance? Well, as as Ben Stockwell pointed out, he uh, he's made progress since college because read the corner blitz perfectly, and this time didn't throw it to the corner that was blitzing. So he did get baited big multiple steps times <laughs> last year. Florida State, NC State, they baited him just to because what happened at Clemson, it was so simple. When they played off coverage, when he saw off coverage, he would throw that quick out nonstop. He just took it, took it, took it. And teams started baiting him. They'd fake the corner blitz, drop back, and kind of bait him into the throw. This time, he did a nice job reading. Yeah, I think he was the most inconsistent of the group in terms of up and down. Like, there was some good, there was some bad. It looked a lot like the Deshaun Watson from college. I think each, you know, there's the other guys, well, with the exception of Mahomes, maybe, I think showed some kind of development, took a little bit of a step forward. Um, Mahomes and Watson, I think, in particular, were the two guys that just looked like the college versions of themselves. You know, for different reasons, Watson, there was good, some good and bad in there. Mahomes is just this, this complete enigma as a quarterback in terms of it's all outside the, the structure of the offense. It's right. all what Mahomes can draw up in his head at the right. time when the play is going on. and just I mean, it's, he's such a fun quarterback to watch, but it's chaos. How is that going to work with Andy Reid? You know, because I, I thought I thought that was a good fit too. Andy Reid and you know his history. A lot of times you hear before the draft, well, this guy's a West Coast offense quarterback, and it's just this generic you know way of describing a guy that probably doesn't have a big arm, is kind of accurate, but it really doesn't hold water with in today's NFL. The West Coast system is sim- more terminology than anything. In my opinion, every team's running similar types of co- concepts. And if you look at Andy Reid's history, he has had success success in the West Coast offense with a guy like Donovan McNabb, with a guy like Alex Smith, and you know Brett Favre back in the day. So he's worked with all different styles of quarterbacks: a, a gunslinger like Favre, an inaccurate quarterback like McNabb. Like McNabb is not the prototype that you're supposed to draw up in the old Bill Walsh West Coast offense. And then the conservative Alex Smith. So if any quarterback, a coach, I guess, can, can adjust to anybody. It's Andy Reid. So that's why I, I'm fascinated by that fit with Mahomes. I just You have to see more structure plays, though, right? You, see, you need to see him hit more structure plays. He missed a couple easy throws that he should have hit. Yeah, the Favre comparison is really interesting because... That was the name I used a lot pre-draft. Yeah, and it makes sense. You know, a lot of this outside of the structure stuff is exactly Favre-like. And, you know, when you were saying that there is going to be one of those crossbody against the grain throws that get, that just looks horrendous. You think far of the throw that cost the Vikings the 2009 NFC Championship game to Sidney Rice. Yes, that's the one I'm always thinking. One of the worst yes. throws you will ever see. Com- you know, nobody nobody would tell you to make that throw, but Favre made a bunch of them in his career, you know, and successful ones. Right. So, for every one of those you're going to get some throws of work and a lot of those throws it's all about arm strength. And a guy like Favre had the arm to make those throws a lot of the times when other people couldn't. And Mahomes has the same thing, 
he has the arm strength to get away with making some of those throws. And you see Aaron Rodgers make a bunch of those throws these days. Same deal. He's got right. the arm strength to make a lot of them. Um, has at least also managed to get, get the ability to not make the bad one as well. But, right. you know, Mahomes is going to have that far thing where he makes a bunch of these incredible throws. And then every now and again, you get one where you think, what, what were you even thinking? What were you right. doing? But where it gets dangerous with him is that he's more athletic than Favre. So the temptation to rely entirely on your athleticism and being able to move around and extend the play and, and stay out of trouble is going to be a lot bigger with him than it ever was with Favre because, you know, Favre was never going to go Michael Vick back in the, you know, in the pocket. He knew that he had to do a certain percentage of stuff within the structure to allow him to create on the run. Almost like Tony Romo, you know, the same kind of thing. Right. You have this generally prototypical pocket passer, and then you have the ability to create when things break down. Mahomes, I think, is is much more athletically gifted than at least Favre. Maybe not so much Romo, but I think the temptation for him is going to be a lot higher to always rely on that. And right. you need to at least, there needs to be a, a, a basis of solid pocket passer from the structure of the offense in order to allow you to do all that stuff. I think the challenge for Mahomes, too, when he's playing at Texas Tech in the Big 12, he saw a lot of three-man rushes, and there was a lot of times he was sitting back there in just a clean pocket because nobody's I – mean, they're, they're just dropping eight so often in the Big 12. The Big 12 doesn't like to play defense. So then he could you know, either sit in the pocket and make a play, move out of the pocket and make a play, and he made some special plays outside of the pocket. So that's always the tough balance is – how much do you pull back and harness a guy so that he can make plays within structure and how much do you but how much do you want to really take away a guy's natural playmaking ability? So I think that's the story for Mahomes moving forward, right? How many plays will he make yeah. within structure? Because when you're looking long term, you still have to make you have to make them. What was interesting about that game is that coming out of that performance, they promoted him to the number two spot on the roster, you know, on the depth chart for Kansas City. And, I mean, it was impressive in terms of the touchdown, made some plays, stats look good. But, as we're saying, it's all outside of the structure of the offense. So, it's interesting that you come out of that game impressed with his kind of quarterbacking performance enough to say, yeah, that, that's, that's worth a promotion on the depth chart. As yeah, opposed to, but I think they knew what they were no, getting I know, and they know what the expectations You know, you, you would think that if you're, if you're looking for a reason to promote a guy like that, it would be, yeah, you executed these plays well, you, you did what we asked of you, blah, blah. As opposed to, that was some great ad-libbing out there, we're just gonna, we're gonna throw you up the depth chart for that. But, that. but this is what I'm saying, that's the delicate balance. Maybe they don't want him to Maybe. win that much within structure. Yeah. Just think about the opposite, which is Alex Smith, which is just within structure. Structure, structure, structure. He never makes those special plays outside of the play call. So they need to figure out that delicate balance with Mahomes. I think that's the big thing. He was 6 of 6 on throws outside the numbers, 65 yards into touchdown. Getting back to Watson for a second, the breakdown on him, 11 of 14 for 88 yards on passes up to 10 yards. So the short stuff, he was good. Like I said, kind of those predetermined, uh, the easier pre-snap reads, he was good. I think the question mark, he did, you know, he over-sailed a couple seam routes and, you know, missed some throws. Four for 12 for 91 yards beyond 10 yards. Uh, and out of that four for 12 for 91 yards, there was a big, you know, before the half, easy stat patter. So uh, a bit of a concern there with Watson in the early going. Let's go to Chicago. So the first quarterback off the board, Mitchell Trubisky. Are we, where are we with this right now? We're back Mitchell to Mitch. versus Mitch? No, no, we're back to Mitch. Is that official? I didn't get the memo. Yeah, yeah, no. It, it turns out that, so the story was going around that his mother preferred Mitchell. Right, I had heard and that. that was, yeah. But it was, it went around as if, you know, my mother prefers Mitchell, therefore, this is the decree. It's now Mitchell. That's Mom how I'm going to be now. Yeah. But it was actually just somebody asked him, is it Mitchell? Is it Mitch? What's the story? I was like, ah, you know, mom likes Mitchell, but... So, so we can call him Mitch now. Yeah, yeah. so his name is Mitch, but his okay. mother happens to prefer Mitchell. Good, because I was worried about his chances coming yeah. into the NFL as a Mitchell. As a Mitch, Concerning. I feel much better. And, and based off his performance, I feel pretty good about the way he played. He was the quarterback on our team of the week this week, I think in part because he did see a little bit more volume than some of the other guys, as impressive as a guy like Deshaun Kaiser was. You know, Kaiser had a few negative plays in there. Trubisky was pretty clean, even though I would say what he was asked to do uh, was a little bit easier. And I still come back to 
the fit, right? He's yeah. in Chicago where just a year ago, we saw offensive coordinator Dowell Loggins work with Jay Cutler, Brian Hoyer, and Matt Barkley. Three completely different style quarterbacks, and for the most part, got pretty good production given what they have as playmakers. Got pretty good production out of those three guys. I thought they did a good job of scheming last season. And then when you look at what they did with Trubisky, he threw a ton of passes on bootlegs, was on the run. Uh, he, he threw the ball on designed, uh, designed rollouts last year at UNC. He was 23 for 26. So that was just a strength of his. And then Chicago's coming out, putting him on the move. And, he, and some of his best passes were just designed rollouts, hitting some tight window shots. And uh, I thought Trubisky looked really good, but also impressed with the way the Bears have handled him. Yeah, this was the performance that would get you promoted on a depth chart because this was a guy who, who did execute exactly what he was asked to do. And then when he had to ad lib, you know, when he got pressured, he took off a couple of times, I think scrambled for 38 yards on two attempts, maybe. Not sneaky fast. I don't want to say sneaky fast, but he, he's, he's got a good athlete. athleticism. He's I mean, a very good athlete. He, yeah, so he's kind of, he reminds me a little bit of Jay Cutler, actually, in terms of athleticism. You know, yeah. a guy who doesn't never it was never really a thing that you talked about, but it was always dangerous. Right. You know, Cutler was always capable. I mean Cutler was it who who did he whose ACL did he destroy with a juke? Was it Brian Erlacher? No, Brady did that. Brady did Erlacher. Who did Cutler did somebody as well where he juked him completely out of his I own ACL. All, but same deal. Like Trubisky's got that kind of athleticism. It's right. the kind of thing where you're probably never gonna bring it up as you know his main selling point but it's definitely a factor in his game um but it, what i'm saying is he was the guy that executed the game plan he went out everything he did was accurate yep. it was exactly what it was, should have been it looked like you know he knew what he was doing and what's interesting is that you know mike glennon as the presumed starter this year had a big contract albeit one that's essentially a one-year deal and glennon looked terrible trubisky looked fantastic right after him if nothing else, Mike Glennon's seat is significantly warmer this week than it was a week ago. Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, everybody likes to talk about you got to sit the rookie quarterback. And I don't mind the concept of go in there and expect to sit your rookie quarterback. I don't mind that as a goal. But you also have to, you know, react accordingly, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my whole thing with Trubisky is... I don't care if you sit him for 12 games. Whenever you feel like he's ready, whenever he looks ready to execute your offense, that's what it's all about. Because a lot of times we get caught up in this season. And for all of these rookie quarterbacks, I don't think it's about this season, except maybe I put Deshaun Watson and Patrick Mahomes in that, you know, they're on these playoff type teams where the decision has to maybe incorporate this season. I think with Trubisky, it's about the future. You know, I think with uh, Kaiser, it's about the future. So whenever they're ready, you roll them out there. But after week one, small sample size, but Trubisky looks like he's at least as ready as Glennon. It, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I'm a big fan of the sit a quarterback for a year thing. I think logically it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And with so many quarterbacks coming out of college now completely unready to take the NFL field, I think it makes so much sense. Guys like Bortles, if the Jags had managed to stick with that plan, it was the plan. sat him for the whole year. Yeah. I think it would have done him better. It would have been better for him to do that. But you see so many of these quarterbacks now, there are a lot more guys now that are ready. If they have it, you know, that special intangible it yes. factor, it, it doesn't matter. They're ready pretty much day one. Right. Russell Wilson, you know, whether you wanted to sit that guy or not, it was clear immediately that Russell Wilson could take the field and be fine. Right. And maybe Trubisky is the same and guy. Dak. Maybe Dak. Yeah, exactly. Guys like that. And, and you know, Trubisky, you look and you say, this is the guy with no experience, you know, incredibly small college career. And everything says you should probably sit this guy. But if he's if he has it, if he's got that factor and right. he's ready to go, then there's no point. You know, you, he's going to be your future, so you might as well throw him out there now. There's also two ways of looking at it, too. People used Trubisky's one year of inexperience as a knock against him. And I, I understand there's just not this history of yeah. one-year starters who have had success. You know, Mark Sanchez was essentially a one-year starter, didn't have success. Cam Newton was a one-year starter, did have success. But it's not a great track record. I looked at, at it as more, wow, there's a lot of room to grow. I was so impressed with his one year. It wasn't perfect by any means. Yeah. But I was so impressed by his one year of play that, you know, and, and I wanted to sit him too. But maybe that is the guy that... <laughs> You just throw out there and needs more experience, and and things will continue to 
to improve. I mean, we're yeah, we're only one game in, but after one game, he has got to be threatening Glennon now. Whereas before, you would put Glennon in, and it's a case of see when Glennon plays himself out of the job, you know, right. and then you then you turn to the rookie. Now I think this is a legitimate competition. Yeah, I think you just start to crank it up a little bit more on Trubisky now, and uh, you know, a few more snaps with the ones, and you know, a few more reps against the ones in preseason action. You know, week three, week four, you know, maybe week four, you just you, you give them the full game type of thing. But I, I think it's time to, uh, you know, to up the ante a little bit. Uh, they kept him clean for the most part, 71.4% of his dropbacks. That's well above the league average. So from a clean pocket, he did a nice job. 100% adjusted completion percentage when throwing from that clean pocket on 19 attempts. Eight of nine with a touchdown on passes thrown in 2.5 seconds or less. So just statistically, keep him clean, get the ball out of his hand. And this is where I come back to the scheme and them taking care of him. Did a really nice job. It was also four for four in intermediate throws. And again, when we talk about the best quarterbacks in the league, have to dominate that intermediate level. And Trubisky certainly did a and, nice job. And the extra bonus there in Chicago is you're going to have Jordan Howard oh, man. in that backfield. Yeah. So he, you know, he's not going to have to carry the entire offense. You should have a... Zeke Elliott style workhorse in the backfield that you can help. Let me say this about the Bears too. I, I always kind of knock them a little bit when I when I look at these rookie quarterbacks and say, well, Mahomes in Kansas City and Watson in Houston, they might be in the playoff picture. But I'll say this about the Bears. They had so many injuries last year. And if you look at their roster now versus two or three years ago, especially defensively, defensively they were – what the wor- probably the worst in the league as as recently as two or three years yeah. ago, just atrocious. They're much better defensively. Offensive lines made strides. The guys like Jordan Howard, you know, playmakers. You add Trubisky. They are on the upswing, and they're probably a better roster than a lot of people give them credit for. And the NFC North, I think, is wide open. The Packers are not going to be dominant. The Vikings could be anywhere in that group. Given and the Lions the were a fluke last year, right? I mean, the Lions. Yeah. They kind of snuck it, snuck into a lot of wins. I think they'll losses. regress a bit, but then we always think that on this podcast, we're the Lions hating podcast. Um, but I other have, than I shouldn't have said that. No, Lions no, fans already have tuned out. Yeah, uh, other than the Lions, the NFC North, I think, is wide open. Um, so yeah, I, mean, I think Trubisky's making it interesting. The one other rookie quarterback that I want to mention beyond the big names is Nathan Peterman. And yes. the reason I want to mention him is because the Bills have clearly given up on Tyrod Taylor and Peterman now has a legitimate kind of audition for the future. Do you think there's a legit opportunity there? Yeah, absolutely. Look, the, the trades that they made and the general lukewarm approach to Tyrod before that, I mean, the whole thing screams that they're not moving on with him. They're blowing this thing up. They're building for the future. You know, 2018 is going to be when they're looking for at which point they're looking for a quarterback, whether it's Peterman or whether they're going to come back and you know take another shot in the draft this year. There's a spot there in starting next year to be won. I, right. I think you know now that he's on the roster, Peterman's got the inside track for it. So this is a big preseason for him. So Peterman was a guy that every time when you watched him live, I wasn't always that impressed. But every time we went back and looked at our numbers and charting and you like rewatched Pitt. They had this really funky offense that just was painful to watch. But when he was put into more challenging situations, all of his numbers showed well under pressure, intermediate accuracy, deep accuracy. So he did a lot of good things, looked really good in week one. Uh, if you want to know about more about Tyrod Taylor, I know that's your love, Sam. I know you love Tyrod. And there's a, there is a lot to like about his game. But Zach Robinson and I broke him down on the big time throw cast. It's just a couple episodes uh, away on your pro podcast, which you're listening to right now, we've decided to throw the big time throw cast on the pro podcast so you can have even more NFL analysis. But we got in depth on Tyrod, his strengths and weaknesses. There are definitely some weaknesses where I can see a team saying, all right, he just doesn't always talk, we talk about Mahomes, he doesn't always win within structure and the way we want to, you know, run our offense. And you just have to know what you're getting with Tyrod Taylor. Yeah. And you, as his biggest fan, Fascinating to hear that you do think, based off the way the cards are following, that maybe they're trying to really push him out and let a guy like Peterman even get a shot at the job. Oh, I think, I mean, it, it looks like they're setting up that Tyrod is almost going to be the scapegoat for this season. You know, they're going to, it's not going to be a good year for Buffalo. I can see that team. You know, we were, t- I was talking with Neil yesterday over lunch, Neil Hornsby, 
BFF founder. Name dropper. Name right dropper. Um, he took you to lunch, huh? He did. And we were wow. talking about who the number one overall draft pick is, or who the number one pick in the draft is going to be this year. The uh, the team with the number one overall pick. And you know, from our AFC preview podcast, it won't shock anyone to say that it's got to be the Jets. And we say, right. okay, well, if you take the Jets out of the consideration, if you assume they're getting number one, who's going to have the number two pick? And... You know, you start thinking about it, you saying, I, I could really see the Bills collapsing pretty quickly this season. You know, fresh off the back of my 2016 Super Bowl pick for them. Did I, we delete that episode in which you predicted hopefully, that? Hopefully, hopefully. Um, but I could, re- I could see that team collapsing in pretty spectacular fashion given w- the moves they've made and the fact that it's kind of all on Tyrod now. You know, if, if their offensive line takes a step back or if they get an injury there, that could easily crumble around Tyrod and suddenly you've just got chaos in that offense. Um, so if they're moving on from him, and, you know, he would be an interesting quarterback for teams. We, we talked about the Mahomes thing. He kind of has that balance already. He makes a lot of plays yeah. within the structure, not as many as maybe you'd want to be that, you know, great quarterback. He makes the big play. He makes those big yeah. chunk plays. I think the problem is that we, we talked like that 10-play drive, yeah. the 12-play drive. You I don't mean, always get that. He can definitely improve, and there's more, you know, he's he's never going to be a top quarterback because of that, because of the plays he doesn't make within that structure. But when you factor in the ones that he makes outside of it, and I think he makes enough within the structure that you can do some really good things on offense with him. And if you've got a guy like Andy Reid coaching Tyrod Taylor, that would be pretty fun. But does a team like the Denver Broncos and another big time Thrillcast plug? We went in depth about Simeon versus Paxton Lynch, and I know Zach, Zach in particular really sees Trevor Simeon's limitations. Mm-hmm. You know, he's we talked about Watson being like a pre snap read type of guy. That is Simeon, where he just doesn't. You know, if you give him something he's not expecting, there's just not a lot there, and that's tough to win with. Yeah, week in week out, and by all accounts, he's way ahead of Paxton Lynch, their first round pick last year. Yeah. So now you're talking about Buffalo's ready to punt this season. We know the Jets are ready to punt, but they don't have anything to offer. Tyrod Taylor, Denver, Tyrod Taylor, anywhere else. Alex Smith and Kansas, not not Kansas City to Denver. That wouldn't be a trade, but there's some there's some quarterback moving pieces. Maybe before the season, and certainly this off season. The off season, I think, is where that gets interesting. I, I don't see any way that Denver admit the mistake of Paxton Lynch if it does turn out that that was a mistake right now you know even if it's looking ugly the guy is you know way behind Trevor Simeon that pretty much speaks for itself they're not going to go okay now we we need to make a move I think what would happen they're still working with this championship level defense but if they're objective about it if things do play out the way we're saying they will and Tyrod Taylor hits the open market in free agency next year I mean, Denver becomes a really interesting place for him to land because you're going to be basically done with Trevor Simeon at that point based on how this season is probably going to go. Right. If Paxton Lynch hasn't taken any kind of step forward by then, you're kind of done with him or right. he's a backup only from that point on and you need a quarterback. And they're probably not going to be bad enough to get a great draft spot. So, you know, we are either trying to make something spectacular happen with, with picks in the draft or Tyrod Taylor's on the market. The ne- next offseason is going to be madness, in my opinion, <laughs> because between you have Tyrod Taylor, you have Alex Smith, yeah. probably looking for a new job, you have Ryan Tannehill, who Miami has to make a serious decision on. So those are three called mid tier type quarterbacks, mid tier quarterbacks that you can win with, yeah. potentially out on the market. And, you know, everybody likes to say next year's draft class is loaded and all that stuff, but legitimately, next year's draft class could have between five and seven quarterbacks getting first round consideration. A lot has to happen. There's a lot of guys that have to improve. But from your Sam Darnolds to Josh Rosens, Lamar Jackson, Mason, there's a lot of names. There's a lot of quarterback movement next offseason between free agency. When and was when was the draft. last time that you that three capable mid-level quarterbacks were available? I mean, those guys don't, don't tend to hit the market. No, I know. I know. I mean, you look at we always joke about like an Andy Dalton deal yeah. where you know what Andy Dalton is. He's a mid-tier guy. But yeah, you can you can move the ball with Andy Dalton if you have the right pieces around him. And a guy that can do that is probably worth $15 million in the NFL these days, yeah. right? So those guys generally don't hit the market. And now we are talking about three, unless I don't know if I'm missing anyone else, but at least those three guys potentially on the market. I do think Tannehill ends up back in Miami. Yeah. But there's been a lot of coaching movement the last couple of years, so you don't know how... They're going to be connected to these quarterbacks. 
And then there's just a lot of guys that are going to be on the market. So already getting into next offseason, let's discuss some of the first round picks. I wanted to go through some of our team of the week, and maybe we can run through that quick. I mean, if you go check profootballfocus.com, our team of the week, we talked about Trubisky at quarterback. I don't know if any of these other names stand out to you, Sam. I'll give you one, though. Cason Williams from the Seattle Seahawks. Great game. Four catches, 114 yards, and everything was up there. Uh, contested catches, just making plays over cornerbacks. Granted, the only cornerback that he made plays over was undrafted rookie Michael Davis, but he's a big 6'2 corner, and Cason Williams was going up and making plays. So take everything with a grain of salt, but you talk about an impressive performance. That's a guy, contested catches, tight coverage. Russell Wilson likes to throw those. That, that could be something there. Absolutely. He had a fantastic game. Like you say, <laughs> take everything with a pinch of salt. Nothing screams first week of preseason more than Tyson Brelo making the PFF team of the week. <laughs> Tyson Brelo right. had a legitimately good game. As is, you know, once you get once you get far enough into the depth chart, even Tyson Brelo can look good for a limited period of time. Broncos left tackle who has struggled in a real football role in the last couple of years and struggled as a starter. Putting it kindly. Uh, the one other name I do want to note: Jacob Hollister of the New England Patriots. And I know the, the Patriots, you know, obviously they're set with Gronk. They signed Dwayne Allen, but that number three tight end spot in New England is wide open. And Hollister is a guy, uh, our guy Billy Moy, one of our analysts, did a lot of the tight end scouting leading up to the draft. He loved Jacob Hollister. I went back and watched Hollister a lot. I loved him. And people that are scouting Josh Allen this year for Wyoming, who's got the huge arm. Uh, Josh Allen loved Jacob Hollister of Wyoming. The guy just went out and made, made plays in tight coverage. He's one of those guys that I think can legitimately uh, challenge for that number three tight end spot in New England. And perhaps, you know, New England has another playmaker at tight end. Just something to keep an eye on throughout the rest of the preseason. The, uh, the other thing I think that stood out in the first week of preseason was all of these rookie pass rushers. Like, pretty much everybody that we've been talking up over the draft process had a big game. Yeah, well, let's go through some of these first-rounders. Who, who stood out to you the most? What, give me a name. Well, you can start number one overall. Miles yeah. Garrett looked ridiculous. I mean, yes. he dominated against the run. Like, didn't have the sack numbers or anything like that, but manhandled guys at the point of attack, which was... He had that one play where he just whooped the left tackle yeah. in .5 seconds, I think it was. It was ridiculous. I mean, he looked... He looked like he'd be, he will be a better NFL player than he was a college player, and he was a pretty damn good college player. Well, the thing about him in college, he steps in as a true freshman as a dominant pass rusher. Not a lot of guys do that in the SEC. The pass rushing was always there. Incrementally got better against the run. And last year, our number four graded run defender in the nation as an edge defender improved his power. I mean, he's a guy that kind of looked like long and skinny, and then he shows up his entire career, bulked up, bulked up, and then at the combine, he's like 6'5", 270. Yeah. So he has the power to play against the run. He dominated tight ends when he went up against them the other night. Like I said, uh, whoops that left tackle, uh, made plays against the run, and has that uh, – he's got the pass rushing ability, the explosiveness off the edge. So definitely love Garrett's game. Solomon Thomas, game. dominated for San Francisco, looked ridiculous, had a hit and two hurries on 20 20- – Pass rushing snaps. He rushed from the interior yeah. a little bit, and that's where again you called him Michael Bennett? Yeah, again, right. looked like the guy we saw at Stanford. You right. know, the same guy. It hasn't changed. The, hitting the NFL has not done anything. Um, thankfully, with Miles Garrett playing as well, I'm at least still in the race with Derek uh, Barnett having a great uh, debut as well. Had two sacks, a hit, and a hurry on 16 pass rushes, which is pretty good. A quarter, oh, yeah. a quarter of his rushes were either a sack, a hit, or a hurry. Let's just remind people what that's all about because, you know, we've been putting stuff up, up on Twitter. We, we actually had one that said, Solomon Thomas, great start to the game. Four rushes, two, two pressures. And so many people respond and it's like 50% of the time. That's not even that good. But, like, let's put it into perspective. The best rushers in the league get pressure about 15% of the time yeah. in the NFL. Some guys get above that. The best rushers are at 15. If you're at 10%, you're still pretty good. Yeah, yeah. If you're at eight percent, that's probably about average. So when you're talking to a guy that's getting you know pressure 20, 25 percent of the time, even though it's a small sample size, that's a legitimate game. Yeah, yeah. And the longer you can sustain that, obviously, the harder it is, and the better those numbers right. become. But yeah, if you're getting pressure on twenty five percent of your rushes, that is huge. It's 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 not something that you're likely to sustain long term. And even just in a single game, it's impressive performance. 
Um, so yeah, Derek Barnett had a really good game. Looks again like a legitimate pass rushing threat. Looks like he's going to be an NFL force. And then the one other guy that I think is interesting is, was Jordan Willis for the Cincinnati Bengals. Got a sack, got a hit. Um, I still don't understand how he's good because it yeah. just looks so stiff and awkward. But it seems to it seems to work. His game was inflated a little bit by his one sack was was awesome. But he jumped the snap, which is like you know that's a skill. Jumped the snap, turned the corner on the right tackle, got around there. But you're right, his his losses look really ugly. Mm. You know when he doesn't get to the quarterback, he does look so stiff. I mean it, it is. It is really crazy because all of us watched him on tape and we're like, all right, he's got burst. He's got the straight yeah. line burst, doesn't turn the corner well, looks awkward. And then he goes to the combine and has incredible change of direction numbers. It didn't make sense. Yeah. Um, so he's another guy that we have to – he still finds a way to get it done. He's still graded well for us. But I always go at, at him with a little skepticism because it just doesn't look right. But we're not supposed to do that at PFF. No, and He's even, getting the job done. Even beyond the, the numbers, he was consistently a problem right. in that game. You know, he was consistently disruptive even without getting the pressure. He, he, you know, he looked like a guy that was going to cause some problems for offenses. I'm just, I'm just fascinated by him because you, you look at him moving. You know, it's kind of the biomechanical <laughs> right. way he functions. And you think it just... It shouldn't be beating people. Like right. it's, it, it, there's no way you you have the like. If you look at Von Miller, you know there's there's a fluidity to the way he moves. Where right, you, it's right. just it's just pure kind of and athleticism. Garrett, yeah, you, you see the same yeah. thing in Garrett and Von Miller. But Miller's like the you know the prototype of that. Right. Where you just yes. look at him and it's just this amazing way of moving that most human beings don't have, right. and, and more to the point, can't match. You know, when you're trying to deal with that, you can't move the way he can. Willis is like the other end of the spectrum. There's no fluidity to it. It's all yeah. like rigid, straight lines. But it somehow seems to beat him anyway. It, it's it's just interesting seeing that it still works, or at least has still worked in preseason. He's a little bit like our Henry Anderson, who ends up on the floor all the time. But yeah, that was still... the only knock. He moves well. He just ends up on well, the floor. Well, I'm, I'm just saying that some, part of his game looks awkward. Just yeah. isn't standard, right? Yeah, yeah. And part of his game is something that a scout's going to look at and be like, Henry Anderson, he's on the floor too much. Jordan Willis just can't turn the corner. But in our system, from a pure production standpoint, they continue to show up. So those are always one of our like case studies, right? The yeah. guys that don't always look the part, but they get the job done. A couple other edge rushers while we're talking about them in the first round. Taco Charlton, Dallas Cowboys, and then TJ Watt, Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, I watched those games really in depth, did some of the grading on those games. And when, when you watch Taco Charlton, uh, I think just from like a look standpoint, you're like, okay, that length and... A little bit of burst, like his great, his best plays looked really, really good. He whooped up a pretty bad backup tackle for a sack, but you know, for a guy that supposedly was having a quiet camp and all that stuff, I think it was encouraging. And Taco is always a guy that I think is just moving in the right direction as far as his career goes. You saw it at Michigan; he continued to get better and better and better. He was our number four graded edge defender down the stretch last year, second half of the season. Um, so I don't always like using the word upside. Mike always likes to yell at me about saying the word upside, but Char- Charlton's that guy who's Best football might be ahead of him, would be the way I'd say it. Preseason will make you appreciate a mediocre starting tackle more than anything else in the oh world. Oh my god. Mediocre tackles are so valuable in the NFL today. When you, you when you have a bad tackle and you're thinking, how hard can it be to replace this guy? Why is he still starting? Watch preseason games. Because when you get to the twos, that's why you can't replace that guy. Because every one of these guys is worse. And right. much worse. Right. So, there... There is some bad play. Look, preseason in general, even worse than the skill of the players, the hardest thing to watch is just the miscommunications because you've got like third string offensive linemen working together and they're trying to zone block together and they're just not, they haven't practiced together. Yeah. So you have some ugly plays. Same thing with receivers and quarterbacks not being on the same page. I want to talk about TJ Watt for a second because this was your classic example. I'm, I'm both ways on this. He had two sacks, QB hit, three hurries, he batted a pass. Statistically, looked great. You have to pump the brakes on Watt, even though he graded well because he made all these plays. The two sacks were gimmies. Yeah, unblocked uh, pressure, another one that was a cleanup sack. Uh, yeah. I, I, you have un- to just – but he had other good rushes that were probably more impressive that didn't result in sacks. It's interesting. The unblocked one is – I've, I've been on both sides of this argument, which, is, which probably makes it a bad argument. But Josh Johnson's a pretty athletic quarterback who saw him coming. 
and he right. couldn't get out of his grasp at all. Right. I mean, he had him absolutely locked up, snagged. Oh, it's not a bad play by any means. No, no, I'm, but it, it was more impressive than your standard kind of unblocked, didn't see it coming, just cleaned it up. You sure. Know, the kind of play that you could make, right. where it, no, you just left unblocked, nobody sees you coming, and you just run up behind the guy and <laughs> yeah. sack. Um, this was, you know, they, they screwed up, they let him loose, but Johnson saw it and is a pretty athletic quarterback and couldn't come close to making a miss with space to work with. Right. So I, it, it's definitely, you know, it's not like he whooped a left tackle instantly and, you know, made a great play, but it's more impressive than a play that was just put on a plate for him and he couldn't fail to make it. Right. There's, there's some at least degree of kind of positivity for making that play the way he did. And I think, you know, the same is going to true across his game. It was, there was definitely things that made it easier for him, but he did well given that. And I think... Yeah. What's really interesting is, I think we posted a graphic on, on Twitter recently um, comparing his first, his debut game to that of the previous Steelers outside linebackers first round draft picks, uh, Jarvis Jones and Bud Dupree. And both those guys had a grade in the 40s. Um, and TJ yeah. Watt was up in the 80s. So Great comparison. It's, it's interesting. It's now their third. And n- neither of those guys, Jones or Dupree, ever really broke no, out of that and it, funk. And it's now their third kind of swing at this, trying to find this outside rusher. And at least in terms of their debuts, this looks like a guy that could be it. And according to our college grades too. So we did yeah. have college grades on Jarvis Jones. We did have college grades on Bud Dupree. Our concern with him, very athletic. Yeah. But our concern with him is all of his production came against FCS opponents and lesser FBS opponents. Really struggled against better competition in the SEC. Nathan Yankee, a noted detractor that year of Bud Dupree. Uh, T.J. Watt was a guy, grade-wise, we said, okay, we think this is a guy that will be better than Bud Dupree. Uh, So far, so good. I will say the other sack uh, for Giants fans who want to trash Eric Flowers, this was your classic, well, actually, from PFF. If you're just watching the game, you see that Eric Flowers is the guy trying to block T.J. Watt on that play who happened to get the sack, but it was not a it was not on Eric Flowers. It was not a sack where you charge Eric Flowers or, or dock him for it because he was in position. He was blocking T.J. Watt just fine. There was pressure from the interior. Quarterback rushed into J.J. Watt. Uh, T.J. Watt. Sorry, I already, I already did it. Rushed into T.J. Watt. Have I been saying J.J. the whole time? No, no. Okay, that was good. the first one. Uh, J.J. Watt's brother finished, <laughs> with the, finished the sack. Finished the sack. T.J. Uh, my point is, uh, Giants fans... If you're listening, don't trash Eric Flowers yet for that particular yeah, play. Yeah. There'll be plenty of time <laughs> to trash him, I'm sure. But that particular play, he's in good position. The quarterback rushed into TJ for the sack. So let's finish this with the one other story that's surrounding preseason, which is Zeke Elliott getting suspended for domestic violence, six games, at least now pending appeal and all that kind of stuff. Forget about the Zeke Elliott side of this. We got a, a chance to look at all the guys that are likely to be carrying the load in the backfield for Dallas for six games. So what did you see? Or how what many games it is. So we've seen a little bit of Darren McFadden already because you know he was in the backfield before they got Zeke Elliott. And we saw that offensive line was good enough to turn Darren McFadden into a thousand yard rusher. Right. Actually make him look like a legitimate running back for a while. Even though grade wise, he yes. wasn't that great. On and the same thing is true now. Darren McFadden was in there, didn't grade well, didn't yeah. look good will still have production because of the Dallas offensive line, if he's the guy. But now they have Alfred Morris. And Alfred Morris is actually a pretty good running back. You know, he has had production behind significantly worse offensive lines than Dallas are likely to put out this year. Right. And at least in preseason, I think we saw if they're forced to go with Alfred Morris, they're in pretty good shape. Uh, 31 of his 53 rushing yards came after contact, broke four tackles. So when you're talking about what the Dallas offensive line is going to do for you, that's the value added that Zeke Elliott was bringing every single down. You know, he will get what's there, and then he'll get a lot more on the back end of, course, of that with, right. with all his broken tackles and his additional yards after contact. Morris is capable of doing some of that stuff as well. So I think they're actually in decent shape if Alfred Morris has to be the guy. And then the other guy that played well was uh, Rod Smith, who had 56 of 64 rushing yards come after contact, after broke three contact. tackles. Obviously, that's not with the first string line working lower down the depth chart. But, you know, I, I <laughs> there's not a whole lot to like about Darren McFadden. And if you're looking for a reason to bump him off the roster, Rod Smith might be that reason. You pretty much know what you're getting from McFadden yeah. at this point. Morris is a guy that has had 
you know, really good success at points in his career, been pretty average at other points in his career. So you, you kind of hope you can get that best out of him. Rod Smith is more of that that unknown. Yeah. But I'm with you on that. I mean, that's, you know, see what those, see what Morris and Smith could do. And the other part of this experiment is we've seen the first play from Lyle Collins at right tackle. Two games now because Dallas were in the Hall of Fame game. So 35 snaps for Lyle Collins playing right tackle has allowed just one hurry in those 35 snaps. That's Great, a really good start. Graded well. So, yep. yeah, I mean, obviously it's only preseason and who knows with the regular season, but so far so good at Lyle Collins at right tackle. Certainly so far better than he was at guard. And those are the big question marks. Lyle moving to right tackle and who's going to play left guard? How good will they be? We just a little while talked about average, right? If you well, get yeah. average play... Because they have three elite players, yeah. you know, left tackle Tyron Smith, center Travis Frederick, right guard Zach Martin, if they can get average, even below, like slightly below average left guard play and some average right tackle play, then they're back up there as one of the top three lines. In the That's the thing. If, if Collins can play okay at right tackle, that makes everything fine. Because yeah. even if the left guard is a total and complete train wreck, you can fix one spot. Yep. You can't fix two. If you've got two disasters, you've got problems. But if Collins is okay at right tackle, and like I say, so far that's been the case, it almost doesn't matter who's going to play left guard. It may be a problem and it may cause some issues, but you can patch it up. You know, there's ways of, of overcoming, especially a left guard. Um, right. But if Collins is a disaster as well, and you suddenly have two, like, two ridiculously bad spots and three all pros, which would be bizarre in and of itself, it's a lot harder to try and right. you know, it, have the sum of that group high. And that's the opposite of... Pittsburgh, when we talked yeah. about in the AFC North preview podcast, Pittsburgh just one to five, left tackle to right tackle, probably the best offensive line as far as just everybody's at least average to good, right? Yeah. So, you know, I think in the NFL today, limit your weak, weak links as much as possible is, is probably the way to go. Uh, the one other thing I want to note about the Dallas running game last year, if you said last year at this time, Dak Prescott's going to have all this success in the NFL. What would be the blueprints to doing it? I'd say this generic, well, you know, ease him in and use him as a runner a little bit and make things easy on him. Dallas actually didn't do that much last year. They didn't use Dak as a design runner a lot. Uh, maybe because they just trusted their line. Maybe because they trusted Zeke. Maybe because they just didn't want to get him hurt, which I understand. Perhaps to get through the first six games or whatever it gets perhaps deducted to. To get through the first few games, tap into Z to Dak just a little bit, a little bit extra zone read stuff, a couple extra keepers, like we've been saying for, Se for Seattle yeah. for you, years. You just a couple need, keepers here and there. You don't even need to honest. expose them. You just right. need to You just need to start showing teams that look. Yep. And it, they can all be handoffs. And then, yeah, and then every now and again when you, when they're giving it to you, you know? Right. Russell Wilson really only keeps those balls when they've stopped playing him on us. And that, is, that essentially cancels out a defensive player because they have to account for yeah. him. And it's just another creative way to, to get through the Zeke suspension. Yep. So that'll do it for us today. A little preseason review. Hit us up on Twitter, at PFF underscore Sam and at PFF underscore Steve. Don't forget, if you guys are drafting your fantasy teams right now, there is literally no better product on the market than our two products, actually, PFF Edge and PFF Elite. Edge and Elite have everything you need to dominate your fantasy league, not only on draft day, but throughout the season, waiver wire, wide receiver quarterback matchups, stuff you literally cannot find anywhere else. And I know I'm just talking fantasy, but when you sign up, we're trying to create this whole community of just football so it's not just fantasy you're also going to get our player grades so if you just want to know the best players on your team other teams player grades and if you want to get ready for the draft preseason draft guide 2018 and if you sign up for edge you get all of this stuff and not only will you get the preseason draft guide you're already set up for the postseason draft guide you're just set up for the year so we're just trying to create edge and elite for people who love football It'll help you in every avenue that you're interested in. So be sure to check it out, profootballfocus.com forward slash subscriptions. Don't forget about playdraft.com or the app Draft. Go and use the promo code PFF to get your first $3 game. Be sure to tune in with us later in the week if you guys haven't already checked out the archive. The AFC previews are up. The East and the West on one episode, the North and the South on the other. We're going to be going to the NFC later this week so be sure to tune in thanks again to everybody for listening we'll talk to you guys next time